last speaker for the morning is my former partner from uh, Oshner Clinic, who's currently now at UC Davis. I guess UC Davis is stealing all the Oshner guys, huh? Uh, Jamie Ross. Uh, Jamie is the associate professor of uh, medicine, and uh, she is the director of the Ac Diocese Access Unit at UC Davis uh, Medical Center. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always good to see you again outside of New Orleans, as well as maybe someday we'll all get to go back. This is kind of interesting since the general talk about dialysis access is coming at the end, but um, how many people here actually include dialysis access in your practice? Okay. Some of you. Okay, well, good. So we'll... Uh, kind of go through the issues for those of you that are familiar with them and learn something for those that aren't. A lot of people take care of dialysis patients. As an interventional nephrologist, I've done several parts of this. Um, it's up to the nephrologist to determine when the time for vascular access should happen. Um, and if basically what kind of clearance this person will need to um, treat their body habitus. Um, they may refer them to you as the surgeon to evaluate uh, your recommendation for the next or the first access and place that access. And then your responsibility becomes to assess when that access is ready for use in addition to uh, intervening or recommending intervention if it's not maturing. The dialysis staff, once they're using this, are the ones that truly examine these accesses on a regular basis and evaluate if it's really functioning. Most nephrologists, when they do their rounds in the dialysis centers, find people who are already cannulated, taped up with their access in use, and it makes it very difficult to, exam, to examine. Um, in my generation of nephrologists, none of us were taught how to examine a vascular access. So even if it was available, the knowledge about what is going on with the vascular access is somewhat limited. And then the interventional physician. I'm an interventional nephrologist. Many of my colleagues here are interventionalists in different types. But those of us who use endovascular means and other means to uh, maintain accesses and improve them. And so if there's a problem, you frequently send that to an interventional, interventional physician and uh, we try to make, make it better. And so all of us are involved in this kind of ongoing process. Once you get a functioning access, it's not your last functioning access. As uh, Dr. Lee implied, even if you get a functioning access, it, it, you may need another one. Uh, this gentleman you talked about may have had one, of, one or two of these last several years, but not forever. And so you're constantly planning, dealing with an access that needs maturing, maintaining the access, watching it fail, and then planning the next one. And the reason that the nephrology community is so concerned about fistulas, in addition to many others, this is just one probably very easy slide to remember, is that the mortality of fistulas is actually as good as these poor dialysis patients can get. This is a relative mortality, and again, if you use fistulas as the baseline of one, all other accesses sh really have a significantly worse mortality outcome for these patients. Not just morbidity, but mortality. And even worse if you're diabetic. And so our goal is to have the uh, best access we can in these patients, and ideally for everybody that's a fistula, but in reality, it's not feasible. So the, the um, organization that really determines our guidelines is Kidney Dialysis Outcomes Quality Initiatives, or KDOKI. And they meet every several years. The last time was 2006. And this is their first guideline, was that patients should have an access early. This is a big issue. Uh, it was really a non-existent awareness when I came to UC Davis that PICC lines were contraindicated in CKD patients. And that's not because we're concerned about central obstruction, although 7% of the time PICC lines can cause central obstruction. It's because they frequently, 
and I don't have the data on this, it's a different lecture, um, cause loss of the veins in the arms, cephalic, basilic, brachial, wherever they happen to be. And so it eliminates the possibility of using the access. We've undertaken a fairly aggressive campaign to limit PIC line use in these patients. The, the goal is to have a fistula placed six months before you need it, a graft about a month. There's a, a new um, push to use grafts as a bridge to a secondary fistula. And PD is becoming kind of in, reinvigorated with the idea that PD can be a bridge to a working fistula. And here's the order of accesses and preference. Fistulas, lower arm, upper arm, transposition fistulas, graphs being less favorable. You could probably stick the HERO device here now. This is again 2006 recommendations, and here we are in 2011. Every time you have a failed access, you should reconsider having a fistula placed. And again, keep in mind a graph can be a good bridge to your next fistula, but you have to work in concert with your interventional person so that they don't put a stent or overly aggressively angioplasty the native vein where you want to put your next fistula. And PD, again, catheters last. This has become a real awareness in the nephrology community that to limit the use of catheters, the length of catheter use, that they cause significant damage, which I'll show you. I, I like showing this slide, even though I know this is really simplistic for a bunch of surgeons, just realize you may never see normal again once you start entering the field of vascular access, that nothing's left that's normal. So approaching to diagnosis, so now that recognizing the failed access, there's a lot of clinical systems. We, in, it, in our area, we use 90% of the time, we use um, calculated transonic flows, which are done by um, saline dilution methods. So we have a fairly good idea of when the access is failing. But a lot of people use decreased clearance, just awareness that the, the arm or extremity is swelling, that they're bleeding after dialysis. They have difficulty cannulation. They've developed aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. And they have pain. These are some of the reasons that you'll get somebody referring to you with an abnormal access. And so this, again, may be simplistic, but it's really good to go over. You should look at the access. You know, looking at the skin, is it thin? Is there evidence of stretching of the skin or any evidence of ischemia? Do the person have central collaterals or collaterals up and down? suggesting venous hypertension or central obstruction? Have they developed aneurysms due to stenosis proximal to that aneurysm? And is there any evidence of infection which would limit any, any intervention at this time at all? And you also want to look at the length of usable access. These needles that are used in dialysis, people have to remember, are an inch to an inch and a quarter long. Now, that has two good and bad issues with it. One, you can't reach a deep access with that. And two, they end up overlapping, but not completely. They cannot completely overlap. So you need probably at least six centimeters of a usable length to even cannulate the area on a repeated basis just in the usable access. So the feel of it, which is identified as the thrill, you can identify, most often you can tell between a fistula and a graft because a graft would be much more firm. I've seen calcified fistulas that have been transposed into a path that kind of ends up feeling a lot like a graft. Um, again, you want to assess the depth. Can you feel that thrill? How, how strong, where is this thing? Oh, how strong for how long? The, the uh, length of the, that you can palpate this really suggests how quickly the arterial pressure is diminishing. If arterial pressure is maintained and not dropped because of an outflow stenosis, you may have a thrill all the way up your access. That's much more common to feel even in normal situations in a graft, but should never be true in a fistula. You can compare the arterial exam to the opposite limb as well to see if there's an abnormal diminishment of, of vessels, implying some sort of ischemia, as Dr. McVickard 
uh, discussed. You can also see if it's, if it's pulsating. Um, pulsations imply that it is not, there's no thrill anymore, so that it's all arterial pressure. On the opposite point of view is that if you actually occlude this and it very little of it increases pulsations. In other words, you occlude a fistula and it doesn't really pulsate like an artery should, you may have poor inflow. Or it may be so high arterial flow already that you're not even sensing the difference between high and highest. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit later. And then you want to listen to this. Um, this is the brewery. And you can tell, and I wish I had, I've been trying to develop a, a little sound library for this, but it should be kind of a, a very holosystolic, kind of low-pitched hum. If it changes frequency, even from low pitch to another low pitch, um, there's something different. If it's a high-pitched frequency, it, fr it most often is an inflow problem. And then the length. Again, if you look at this, you have to remember at some point to listen to the heart and that the uh, ectopy you, you have, if you have, say, bigeminy, we've had a patient recently like that, that the uh, pitch of everything's going to change as your um, PVCs are not actually pul delivering the same amount of uh, blood to the circuit. So here's some normal graphs, and this is actually not how I typically see a graph. This is a graph that goes from the brachial artery to the basilic vein. Frequently you'll still see them up here, but again, this is a graph. Here's a much more typical upper arm graft where you're looking at the basically attachment site to the vein or the venous anastomosis, and it makes a curve upward. This is, I'm still having trouble with this. Well, the bottom right is a looped forearm graft. And then the bottom, excuse me, the bottom left is a looped forearm graft. The bottom right is a straight forearm graft. And here's some fistulas. Now you can see, at least if you just look at them, they look, some of them look like grafts. This is a superficialized cephalic vessel. And it's irregular, kind of large parts, small parts, very suggestive of a nice fistula, but kind of unusual for just a regular old cephalic, but it's been altered. This is, the bot below that is a typical just cephalic upper arm fistula. Top right is a basilic vein transposition, and you can see the long scar that was involved in creating the tunnel. And again, maybe from afar at least confused with a graft. This is a, a kind of a forearm, bottom right is a forearm semino fistula gone bad here. And here's some unusual situations. I think we've talked about basilic vein transpositions. Toward the elbow is the AV anastomosis. The basilic vein has been swung up and you can kind of see it being turned back and turned into a nice loop there. That stretch on the vein does not make the vein happy. Veins do not like receiving arterial pressure. They do not like being moved out of their vascular beds, and they don't like being swung around. And so they tend to get scars. Hey, look at that, right here. And this is a typical stretched out version. Actually, that actually looks pretty good compared to some of the ones I've seen. But this uh, swing point is a area where you frequently have problems. Here's another special situation. While you know, you've attached a artery pressure to this cephalic vein and ultimately to the cephalic arch, the arch itself dives under the clavicle and uh, frequently has stenoses uh, with or without any history of, of instrumentation prior. This particular um, Picture here shows the stenosis again at the subclavian brachiocephalic junction, likely that was caused by a right IJ tunnel catheter as well. Over here is another one. Yeah, I'd love to make it over there. Maybe someone else. Okay, 
Hopefully all of you know where the deltoid insertion is. Again, the cephalic vessel goes under the um, muscle there and at the deltoid insertion also causes some impingement and frequently that's another site of problems. So you can almost walk into a cephalic fistula that has outflow stenosis and say, I think the problem is at the deltoid insertion or maybe the cephalic arch. And really most of the time you'd be right. Makes, makes my field somewhat simple. Here is the Gras fistula, which is attached to the median cubital vein and essentially hedges bets in the sense that you have the median cubital vein, the basilic system, and the cephalic system all attached. And what I see frequently, though, is that the turbulence causes something like this, and you've essentially lost one of these. So evaluation now of the inflow Using your pads of your, of your fingers here for vibration is actually the best vibration sense you have. You can tell if it's pulsing or is, does it, can you feel the thrill? Is, d does this thrill diminish over this length or not? If it, if it doesn't diminish, there's that, that's actually abnormal. Compare in the artery flow, as I've said, and augmentation. If you press with one finger, you can always tell which side the artery is coming from by which side of your finger is still pulsating, but you can also see if the pulsations get stronger. If they don't, you have an inflow problem. Um, again, listen to the th artery flow with or and without augmentation, and a high-pitched flow will usually imply an inflow stenosis. This is not exactly normal, but it was a good picture to show you anyway. Here is a little bit of an abrupt transition. Most graphs, and this is a graph, the straight um, vessel on the left is the artery, and it meets the graph. The graph should be gently tapered, and this one tapers abruptly, but it's got a good width, and there's really nothing wrong or needing intervention. So that's at least as close to a normal artery anastomosis. The idea is that you don't want the arterial anastomosis to be the same size as the artery, because then you end up with steel. And there's been some really good data showing this, that if you look at this graft, and again, I have the article someplace if those folks, if you want to review this in terms of what the hemodynamics of this is, but you don't want the anastomosis to be more than 75% of the artery, and this is true for the upper arms. I don't think there's been establishment of what the relationship should be in the legs. After that, you get ischemia. There's also been an, an awful lot of research on the angle, if you're using a graft, that's the optimum to create laminar flow. There are many people that believe that laminar flow improves your outcome. Lots of studies by a man named Roy um, Chaudhry, who has shown that turbulence alters the cellular development of endothelium. And so here is what the ideal laminar flow is. So here's some of the problems. This is a fistula, and you can see on the right is the nice smooth arterial tree that hits the venous, an the venous arterial anastomosis. There's a narrowing there that would be called the arterial anastomosis and have a stenosis. Just beyond that to the right is a juxta anastomotic area. Both of those are what we frequently see in fistulas. Now, whether that's due to alteration in barrow pressure, trauma, needling cannulations, or surgical scarring, it's really hard to say but it is a frequent site. And then we look at outflow stenosis. You can um, basically maintain your arterial pressure and you have nowhere to put this high pressure flow. And so you end up, and end up with a conduit that's at the same pressure uh, that your artery is uh, ultimately. And here is a typical venous anastomosis stenosis in a graft. It's the 90% of the time we see abnormalities at the venous anastomosis. There's a lot of um, folks doing uh, studies on as to why animal hyperplasia is so high at this point, but it is. You can almost see in this picture, I, I used it because you can see that whitish area has a lot of intimal ingrowth. Now we're going to go on to central stenosis, and, and 
Dr. Um, Lee didn't show you what these people look like, but this is a, a picture from a friend of mine, Michael Alon, and University of Alabama. And, and basically, they just have swollen arms, swollen chests, uh, can even be bilateral, and some people have severe life-threatening SVC syndrome. And here's some pictures of what happens with prolonged material, shall we say, in your central circulation. On, on, the, on the left is someone who has a stent and has what I call the Medusa look. And you can angioplasty at that and make the collaterals look better for a time. The person on the right is even in worse shape. There's absolutely no way to get from what little left is of the subclavian into the central circulation, at least I could not, and they already have a right-sided central tunneled catheter, losing yet another possibility for them. The most difficult to diagnose are if you have both inflow and outflow mismatch, is what I call it. Um, that means that you don't have enough arterial blood coming in to reveal your outflow stenosis. So when you examine these fistulas that somebody sent to you or graphs, they feel normal. So that if you have an outflow stenosis, it's now making your arterial inflow that's inadequate look pretty good. And your in inadequate inflow isn't even challenging your outflow stenosis. So it's, it's a little confusing. So you are fooled completely. So here's an example of one. This is the same axis, and you have an arterial lesion on one side and the venous lesion on the other, and the exam was completely normal. And so I'm just going to briefly talk about aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. While native vessels can have pseudoaneurysms, as you know, grafts cannot have aneurysms. So if you have graft material, the only thing you're going to have is a pseudoaneurysm. It is going to be fibrous material that is covering an area of degraded graft that is barely hanging on. And in the bottom picture, in the lower needle, there's a puffy area that really is a pseudoaneurysm, and they're sticking through basically no graft. And if you actually push on that area, you will feel no graft material, which I find always frightening. This is a dilated aneurysm above that may or may not, in some cases, have an obstruction proximal to this. Some people have a fairly flexible, stretchy cephalic vessel that enlarges and enlarges and enlarges and may or may not be related to persistent stenosis above. But an infected aneurysm is an emergency, as many of you may have deal dealt with, whether you actually work with access or not, you may have been called in. And if an aneurysm is infected, chances are that at some point in the near future, it will blow, and you will have arterial blood pouring out of this area, and it will become a vascular emergency. And so I, I've sort of put a list for you of what interventionalists do in this area. You know, whether you choose to get involved in it or not, these are some of the things that we can and can't do for you. Um, and some of the things have been discussed here today. And here's the sad part of my lecture. This is from last century, and we haven't improved. So one of the issues that K. Doki was looking at is that fistulas last much longer than grafts. And I think Dr. Lee kind of spoke to the fact that our success rate is not very good. But if you look at this, grafts basically are down to 50% functionality by one year without intervention. And fistulas do much better. However, here's the key. After the first intervention, fistulas and grafts start behaving in a similar manner. That what you do by intervening with angioplasty and some of the aggressive techniques that, which are all we have available at this time, you've changed the response of the endothelium, you've injured it, and now they become parallel. And, and I don't know of any data in the 21st century that has changed this yet. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Well, that concludes our morning session, and we will reconvene this afternoon at 4.15.